inside sliding window. Webster is next on BCTV. Good morning, it's good to be back. 1981 is going to be an absolutely smashing year. I have a number of surefire predictions. Canada's constitution will be patriated with the unanimous consent of all of the provinces. Pierre Trudeau, once he gets out from underneath his dancing chic to chic and his visits to Europe, is going to pay a state visit, pick up the constitution, and then resign as prime minister and become president of the new Republic of Canada. And after that, of course, Joe Clark will quietly and without too much nudging resign as leader of the Conservative Party. Peter Lougheed, believe it or believe it not, I predict in 1981, will suddenly agree to Ottawa's terms on the Energy Pact, and they'll all kiss and they'll all make up. Bill Bennett will actually pay Ottawa its gas tax, and furthermore, he will be freely available to the media at all times to answer fully any embarrassing questions that come up. Davy Barrett will lose 25 pounds and look like the sylph he should be. Brick will go up to $10 a share. Harcourt will be the first to ride on Van der Zam's rapid transit system, yes, in 1981. And said Webster, slightly off his rocker this morning, back from the Hawaiian tribal right at Christmas time, the Vancouver Canucks will win the Stanley Cup. But to get to the point this morning, I have a vision. I had a vision earlier this morning about Pier BC. That one day, perhaps, if and maybe, Pier BC will be transformed into the most beautiful trade and convention center about which everyone will be happy. And for the purpose of giving us the finite information this morning, who is in my studio? None other than the ever-charming Grace McCarthy, the minister responsible. And none other than the man for all seasons and all projects, Gordon Shrum, who's going to make sure that if it's built, and we'll find out about that, it will come in within budget. Then on the happier side of what happened over Christmas, we've dragged in Stephen Rogers this morning to tell us if after the floods at Squamish, they are so too going to pay, and elsewhere, people who've already received flood claim payments having built on flood planes in British Columbia. So on this happy, positive note, not a word of criticism di directed even to judges. And by the way, I'm sure that there will be no judges involved in public improprieties in 1981. There better not be, but we'll go into all the details of PNBC after the break. A person like myself must be extraordinarily careful not to be used as a propaganda outlet or a brainwashing outlet for the government in power, no matter what the government is. But I've been looking quite coldly at this pure BC confusion. 
and I say that quite bluntly, P and B C confusion, from 25 million bucks to 100 odd million dollars perhaps. It's been hanging fire for well over a year. Harcourt is dragging his feet, half the city council is dragging its feet, and here this morning is the minister in charge of the project, Grace McCarthy. Good morning, Mr. McCarthy. Good morning. And just one simple question. Is this project going to go ahead despite what looks like the opposition and the fears of Vancouver City Council? Is it going to go ahead regardless of cost? Well, we're very enthusiastic about it. I'd say yes. I'd, li I'd like to say a couple of things, though. When you say regardless of cost, let's not, uh, let's not kid ourselves that if it goes into millions upon millions beyond, that we will be as good uh, custodians of the tax dollar, uh, extremely concerned. Uh, I belong to the school of thought that thinks, doesn't think that uh, big is beautiful and doesn't think that small is beautiful. I believe that appropriate is beautiful. And it's about time that we addressed ourselves to the appropriate expenditure of tax dollars. And I think this is a very appropriate expenditure of tax dollars because it will bring a return to the province and to the city and to the nation, which no other project on the drawing board at the present time will give to this province. Can Vancouver City Council stop the project by refusing to participate at any level from here on in? Can Vancouver City Council? Harcourt told me, not the other day, that he wants to move the whole thing off Pier BC because of the, the view blocking and the c communications and connections problems and put it down somewhere in Falls Creek. So leave that for the moment and answer my but question. But that's impractical. It couldn't be done. It, it cannot be no, moved. It could not be moved because of the cost. Uh, we're talking costs now, and the, the reason that this has been slowed down is because of inflation and because of the accelerating costs. And if one moves it to a different location, uh, our estimates on, say, moving to the BC place, and we still don't know what the charge will be against that, but the modest, the most modest charge would be would add another $30 million. Well, remember, remember, we have, we have, we should be given credit for putting together an extremely reasonable piece of property, the most valuable piece of property on the, on the west coast of North America, and that is Pier BC, three and a half square city blocks for under $5 million, $4.6 million. You know, that's, that's just simply a gift. We should be lauded for that. But You'll never buy Pier BC land at that price, or rather uh, BC Place land for that price, nor any other land in the Lower Mainland which would be suitable for a trade convention this, center. I mean, obviously, you're totally in favor of it, and you'll do all you can to get this through. But so that poor layman like myself can understand, when City Council meets on the 20th, if it says no, is it dead? I would think that there's a very good chance if they say that they will not participate further. Uh, we are short of funds. We have a, we have a shortfall. We cannot begin to uh, build until that shortfall is overcome. Okay, the, the shortfall, shortfall is, is approximately, uh, Dr. Shrum believes, is approximately $20 million, uh, maybe between 20 and 25 million, and that has to do with the, uh, with some of the foundation uh, that is going to be uh, results of which we'll have within about a week or 10 days. But say between 20 and 25 million, if that is to be made up by three levels of government, we're talking about something like 10, 10 and 5 or 8, 8 and 4, which is not a... Uh, One, the feds, a, the feds are only committed to a flat grant at the moment, correct? One third of the, uh, one third of the total cost of the center, trade convention complex, uh, and not to exceed the provincial government. And uh, the provincial government, by the way, exceeds the federal contribution at the present moment. So you've got one thud from you for sure, one thud from the feds on their promise. Is that correct? There has to be negotiations there, but I can't see how the federal government could refuse such a tremendous offer from the province of British Columbia and from the city of Vancouver. Because As you know, the City Council of Vancouver is very worried about its mill rate and its taxis, and it can see all kind of hidden costs and connection costs and Harcourt is dead against them at the moment. Well, let's talk about the hidden cost. The, uh, the, if, if this project goes through, the marathon project adjacent to it will go through, and those two projects alone will net, net a $3 million net return on business taxes to the city of Vancouver each and every year. $3 million that if those two projects aren't built will not be netted to the city of Vancouver. We don't need to go into great details because we've got a model here. But Marathon, if all goes well, although they've stopped at the moment, are going to cover the tracks and put up their three blocks. Isn't that correct? Two blocks. Two blocks. Two blocks. 
Uh -huh. One is, one is, is an, an atrium which joins the two, and you might say it's a third building, but it's all glass and it's, it's sort of an adjoining Question. structure. There are difficulties, and if costs <laughs> did go out of reach, the project would be cancelled. Correct? Well, yes, I, that's true. If it went out of reach, let's say that we can keep it to what I call is an appropriate uh, level and, uh, and let's all pull together. Let's not say that the city of Vancouver should say, oh, because of this we're going to, let's all work together to build it. We've been trying now for four years and each and every month the cost goes up and because of the tremendous benefits to the city of Vancouver, uh, certainly it will benefit to the point that, for example, uh, we have a return coming into the city of Vancouver. New money, the balance of payments for Canada regarding our, um, our tourism dollars, it's not recycling local money, it's bringing in new dollars, found dollars to the city centre and, and that in jobs alone, in jobs alone has a tremendous benefit. Sitting here this morning though, you're still fighting to influence the city council particularly to go ahead in cooperation on the project. That's right, because we're all faced with, an, uh, with a shortfall Very of, of some money. Very simple question. Yours is an aggressive government when it comes to construction. Ipso facto BC place, right? Well, ipso facto the uh, unemployment rate in the city of Vancouver. The same city of Vancouver that has to make these decisions has the lowest unemployment rate for years and years. And why is that? Because there's confidence in the economy, there's building in the economy, and we have created jobs in this locale as Mrs. well as McCarthy, throughout the province. If the city council says no, which is liable to do on the Bowers <coughs> report, they're all panicking about that, why don't you the provincial government take over the whole project. Traditionally throughout this nation, throughout North America, cities have been the ones who have initiated trade and convention centers. This is the first time, and again we can be given credit for for having brought in federal and provincial monies. This is the first time in Canada that a provincial government has been involved in a trade and convention center. The first time in Canada that the federals have been involved in a trade and convention center. And we should be given credit for having brought those monies. Frankly, the city of Vancouver should have built a trade and convention center 30 years ago. We would be competing now on a world market, a world that is at our feet, half the world's population on the Pacific Rim. And Jack, you can't serve half the world's population, over two billion people, from a phone booth. Fair enough, but at the same time, as we sit here this morning on, what's this, January 5th? Five. January 5. Quickly time goes when you're having fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> January 5, the fact is that it is not a firm commitment yet from anybody to build this giant, beautiful, gorgeous, attractive center. Oh yes, there's a very firm commitment on th three levels of government and those three levels of government all have to decide that the shortfall they face of approximately 20, 22 million dollars will have to be divided between the three of them on a 40, 40, 20 basis and that's not difficult. Okay, the 20, 22 million dollars, Bauer says 20 to 26 to 50, but we'll ignore him for the moment. 20 to 22 is for an outside cost of what? About, uh, Dr. Trump, 85, 85 million, million we'll say. you have to bear in mind that I think your information not correct. My information from in, uh, discussions with uh, Mike Harcourt, the mayor, is that he's strongly in favor of the project. You've got to be joking. No, I'm not. I, I think you get, ask him, and uh, I think he I will say that he thinks that, well, it was reported in the press that the city the size of Vancouver should have a trade and convention center. He stated that in the press. Yeah, but he wants it in Falls Creek. No, well, no, he doesn't. When he sees what the cost would be to take it over to Falks Creek, that's only adding, as Mr. McCarthy says, $30 million more to our over... Uh, One question to you, Dr. Fall. Shum, before we go look at the model with yeah. the architect. Um, there have been great mutterings about very serious pilings problems uh, whereby you'll need massive concrete caissons to hold the whole thing up. True or false? Uh, true. That's but the they're not unreasonably expensive. Just we'll 20 need million. caissons. We always knew we needed caissons to hold the project up. You can't build something on the water without support. Are you finished support. the tests now? The test will be finished tomorrow morning. Webster and the PC beer, PC beer, <laughs> beer BC. It's a new liquor. <laughs> Trade and Convention Center. Next, we're going to look at the model with the architect and the man for all projects after the break. With me now is Barry Downs, who is the architect 
Because when this first came out, all we had was an artist's conception. We have got real plans and drawings for everything, do we? That's very much so. We're underway with final uh, design drawings right now. Now, just take a moment, and you can use the pointer garden, and come from the front back to these glass things and explain what's happening. Either one of you. Well, this is the pier out here, Pier BC. The same size as it was before, a little higher here. And on top of it, there's a hotel, a uh, 500-room hotel, and a small office building, small compared with these other buildings you see here. Now, I want to just make one point this morning, Jack, and I want to make it very firmly because there are a great number of people who have been uninformed, misinformed about the view. Could I take a minute and show you? Here, Here's a model of the city. This is Hastings Street along here. Now then, if one is on Hastings Street and you look down Burrard, this is Burrard, you can't see the pier at all. So there's no interference of view. Just a minute, though. We've got this chuckly old bridge here. Yeah, that's going to be rebuilt. A very fine new overpass. That's part of the project. And by the city or by Pier BC? We're paying about half of it. And the city is paying some, Marathon's paying some, the government's paying some. Now here is uh, here's Granville Street over here. It doesn't interfere with the view. This does interfere with the view, but not our project in any way. That's Project 200 of the CPI. That's 200. That's, uh, uh, and here is Hornby Street. Hornby Street doesn't go through. Hornby Street never was a through street. Now then, Howe Street. Here's Howe Street. When this project is completed, there'll be a road down Burrard, up Howe Street, and at the present time, you go down the foot of Howe Street right there, and you see the railway tracks, nothing but the railway tracks. Now then, if we look down Howe Street, you'll see that these two buildings don't, and this one doesn't interfere with the view at all. You just can see the corner of this building. The only thing that interferes with the view is the main pier, and that is somewhat higher than the building that was there before, but there was a building there before that interviewed, interfered with the view. Now, if we're worried about the private views from these high-rise buildings, they are already blocked by other people. And so if this building complains about blocking the view, it blocked the view from this building, and this one blocked the view from this. So I don't take in consideration private views. Private views have anything to do with it. I'm only talking about the public. The average man on the street or in his motor car driving along Hastings Street, is there any blocking of the view? The answer is practically no. No, but there's a very big if, and, and but in this body. These glass structures here, what yes. are they at the moment? Well, that's the marathon development, uh, which is right now sitting on the shelf but waiting for a decision on the pier. Um, that represents a 43-story office building and a 12-story office building with the an atrium, a market, a commercial atrium between. But let me understand this. That only becomes a real thing with the tracks covered over and your you driveway well, round if yes. they go ahead, if the city council locates it. That's right. Pure BC development sparks other development on the waterfront. It's the first chance for the citizenry as well to get onto the pier, to walk 2,200 feet out to a destination plaza at the end to take in the boats and the ships. But the out. whole glamorous design depends on Marathon going ahead with this so the no. tracks are covered. No, well, to cover the tracks, yes. But if Marathon doesn't go ahead, we will still go ahead, but the tracks will not be covered. I think that the, the not only is a trade and convention center, but there are two things that great benefits to the people of British Columbia. One is to uh, cover the railway tracks, to get those covered. We can't have proper access to our waterfront if we have to look on those, down on those tracks and go over them. And the other is to open up the waterfront. They had a study made of the uh, development of the waterfront by a separate consulting firm, and they stated in this the, uh, that the uh, Trade and Convention Center would be the key to the development of the whole waterfront oh, in British Columbia. Beautiful design, beautiful design. It all just now depends on, one, the cooperation of the city council, the cooperation of Marathon, cooperation of the federal government, and raising the money. Am yeah. I right? Well, we've had this good cooperation up to date, I would say, uh, considering all, uh, it's not you easy. You said I was wrong in what I said about Harcourt. I think you are. I'm sure, I have great confidence that uh, Mayor Harcourt supports the project. 
he realizes you can't possibly buy land at uh, whatever a square foot in False Creek from uh, B.C. Place. Uh, it costs $30 million at least more to do it, move it down to False Creek. In any case, Har Mayor Harkert said, reported in the press, and I'm sure he said it, that a city of the size of Vancouver should have a trade and convention center, especially since the Americans have opened up the whole uh, okay. convention business. Now. Question to architect Barry Downs. How tall is that building? The That's hotel. 20 stories, Jack, 20 stories high. We got a deal on that, didn't they? Who's, who's putting that up? Intrawest uh, Well, it isn't settled yet who's going to put it up, but we hope that it will be Intercontinental Hotels, and that's one of the, probably the most prestigious hotel chain in the whole world today. That will be a five-star hotel. But no public parking on the waterfront. Well, yes, there'll be parking. We have 900 car parking stalls planned for now, and there are a total of 3,000 parking stalls within the one block area, assuming there'll be about 800 and 840 parking stalls here. This is a bit of a monstrosity, though, isn't it? I have nothing to say about that. I o I'm only anxious to get the waterfront covered. I mean, the railway <laughs> tracks covered. Gentlemen, your basic point, because of uh, certain aesthetic objections, give me a ruler. Okay. Hastings Street, Barrard Street with a new bridge, Hornby Street. Uh, this building blocks it. Uh, yeah. We're hoping to have a, a walkway through there. And House Street right through. Yeah, very little blocking the view. And well, I, I hope you get the money, gentlemen. Back to Grace McCarthy. My thanks to Barry Downs and Dr. Gordon Schramm. Many projects. Let the ladies have the last How many word. projects have you got going at the moment? Is this the only one? Oh, this is enough for me, an old man like me. Simon Fraser, BC Hydro. You've done everything. Oh, those are all province. completed and uh, very successful. Oh, and Robson <laughs> Square. Sure. Well, it was $29 million under uh, estimate. Oh, now you don't want me to accept that. It wasn't $29 million under the original estimate. No. No, but my, uh, when I took over, it dropped 29 million. Yeah, well, that's more accurate. Now she'll be back after the break. Well, I don't know. You know, you had me at the beginning, Gordon, and I'm sure you feel the same as I do. You hate to be a propagandist for something that might be just a balloon in the air. It's not a balloon in the air. This it's is probably volume. the most important thing that's happened, certainly the most important thing that's happened to down va town Vancouver since it was incorporated. Except for BC Place, Grace McCarthy would tell you. Yes. Well, but this coming afterwards. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. going to be in charge? Oh, no, you're near no, odds doing BC Place. That's right. You turned it down, I presume. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're very fortunate to have Dr. Schramm in charge of this, as he uh, mentioned to you earlier, that he did save us ab about 20, over $25 million on the, uh, on the building of our Robson Square complex. One question on finances. Mara used to be a student of mine, you know. <laughs> that's why it's so bright. Yeah, well, that's why he's so <laughs> well informed. When you say $85 million yes. for this complex, yes. that's the city, federal, and provincial cost. That's right. Is that for a 4,000 or a 10,000 convention center? Uh, that's for uh, about 10,000. 10,000? Mm-hmm. We're not cutting down the size of the convention center in any way. The only thing is that if we want to save money, we can reduce the span on the big uh, convention hall and the span on the exhibition hall. If we're stuck for money, we can reduce that span so that the number of people you can seat without a post interfering with their view uh -huh. goes down from 10,000 to 8,000 to 6,000, something of that sort. But Gladys, that doesn't mean smaller on, on the outside. Gladys, any calls on this this morning? Let's try for a couple of calls on this before we go. I'd like to hear what people say. Uh -huh. I would too. Because, you know, it's been rattling around now, as I you know. reminded me, for four years. Four years, yeah. Four years since you brought out the fancy little booklet, first of all. That's right. The mm -hmm. artist's conception. It's interesting to note that the cost of the trade convention complex itself is still the same price as it was four years ago, in spite of, in spite of inflation. You mean the because $25 million dollar figure? The acceleration uh, was built into that $25 million dollar figure. But remember, the city of Vancouver is getting a remarkable deal. It's getting, an, it's getting a road system, which they had long planned for, the Cordova Street extension, which approximately $6 million is loaded onto the pier price. 
they're also getting um, a, re a revenue, as I mentioned. And uh, all of the, the, the cruise ship facility is all going to be uh, new and exciting. And, and of course, people won't come into an old warehouse anymore when they come in with their cruise ships to Vancouver. I believe, however, you do have an ultimatum right now, which you're prepared to say on air about a time deadline for agreement on the project. No question. It will have to be decided by the end of this month, the end of January, because we have a quarter of a million dollars each and every month that uh, accrues to the, uh, as a deficit to the project because of inflation. One quarter million dollars monthly. And so the cost of money and the cost of the, of the project simply has to, be, has to be made, decisions have to be made this month. Now, the By only the decision, what is the decision you need? Do you need the a decision dis I need from the, uh, that we need as a, as a city, uh, our city uh, representatives have to make a decision that they are enthusiastic and wish this city to live up to its remarkable potential of the third largest city in Canada and the greatest city in Canada and put up some money, some more money. Uh, the uh, federal government has to uh, pay tribute to its trade potential for the Pacific Rim and put up some more money. And with those two in hand, there's no question in my mind that my colleagues in the cabinet and the treasury board will put up the balance from the provincial government. Grace McCarthy tells Webster that they must have a cooperative approval from the city council and the federal government by the end of January or mm -hmm. Pier BC is down the tube. Yes, I would say that is a fair statement, and uh, I would hope that uh, the, what you have done this morning and uh, what we have tried to impart to the people throughout this province and, uh, and in this nation, that this is needed for our trade, that this is needed for jobs, this is needed for ongoing jobs, I hope that message will have clearly have, have been received by those who are in that decision-making. Go area. ahead, please, to Mrs. Sherman McCarthy. I hope I've got two questions for the Honorable Grace McCarthy, and I hope you will let her answer them. The first one is, with the provincial government refusing to pay the tax on the gas, which uh, comes to about $3 billion, I believe, how does she expect the federal government to kick through with funds for what they want? Good question. Well, it is a good question, and I'd love to talk about the constitutional debate and, and the difference we have with the federal government. But let's remember, we've had a very good cooperative association with the federal government now for the last five years. I would say that it's probably the best in the province's history in terms of cooperation. There is no question that we have had a, dis a, a, a real dispute, and we'll continue to have if the federal government continues on their, on their bent to nationalize and to, uh, and to, to uh, say to our people that they'll take out of our, t our pockets the tax dollars that are spent on such things as my human resources ministry and my colleagues in health and education. And if they want to take that money right out of our pockets, yes, we'll continue to argue with them. We weren't elected to be patsies for the federal government. But we also, I appreciate, we're elected to cooperate with all governments, and we've certainly done that for fairly well in this province. Your answer is that you don't consider the McClellan I certainly uh, don't. veto on paying the tax will affect this cooperation. Absolutely. Jack, on that very same thing, Next may question. I ask her? Go on. Yeah, may I ask her, the provincial government has declared that tax as an illegal tax. Now, what would she say if everybody burning gas said we will not pay that tax, and instead of funding it in to the provincial government held it at home. <coughs> well, I'd love to get into that debate with you. We're not discussing that debate, and if people wanted to do that, they have they are free to to, well, to, I, think to I think you're a bit off on so. that one because yeah. if they're but not paying can't. the tax, we're not paying the tax. Yeah, we're not, you know. Oh yes, we'll be paying the tax, you and you'll be holding it back. That's right. And oh, he's tax. right. Well, we've also made the statement. To hold that tax back himself. But remember, we've also made the statement that uh, the interest that accrues will be returned if the uh, court case uh, or the or the judgment is that we must return those dollars. It will be returned at interest, and uh, Go ahead, there's no please. discussion on that. Go ahead, please. Yeah. What are you? Can't hear. You. You know, my whole opinion of this deal is just a phony, bloody deal. Marathon is controlling the whole damn thing that's on their property. No, that's not true. It's not on the Marathon property. Sure. Now, just a minute. I uh, mean, the piling and everything has been, sure enough, they destroyed no. the buildings. And, and destroyed what buildings? You mean the, you mean all. Those, yeah. the overrun, old pier that was overrun, there for over 50 overrun. years? You have no, no cost, a precise cost. Oh, yes, we anything. have. Yes, we have. The, the difference between the price four years ago and today is 
is firstly inflation and secondly the added, the additional items that were placed on the pier and have burdened the Pier BC development. They are all, by the way, those additions which will benefit the city of Vancouver and which will improve the city of Vancouver. But for, for you to say that it's a marathon development, remember we brought marathon into the picture by, by introducing the Pier BC development. We, for, for years, they've sat on their property and have not developed their Sound property. More, more than the property. Sure, and, well, the and they Harbors haven't done board anything owns with it. The pier, not marathon. Well, it's not marathon. No, no. National Harbors Board. National Harbors Board. Sure. But the marathon from owns the tracks. We had to pay the National Harbors Board for a lease for the pier for 90 years. Nothing to do with marathon as far as the pier is concerned. Right. Go ahead, please. Hello. Speak up, please. There's Mr. Webster, Mrs. McCarthy, and Mr. Shrum. I'm a concerned citizen, resident of British Columbia for 60 years. Fair enough, what's your concern? As a, as a taxpayer, right. the greatest positive step that any city could take place, because on our waterfront, as you know, and everyone knows, we have a disgrace in regard to a tourist approach to our city. That's your point, Grace, isn't it? We can do two it? jobs at one time. Build okay. a great convention center. Your father great project. Great for the, the tourist industry and these cruise ships that ply our coast. Now, even a Russian ship is running up and down our coast. And if we can't get a hold of that tourist business, there's something wrong with us. And I oh, say, get so on with it. Accentuate the positive and every citizen cooperate. Thank you very much indeed. Go ahead from Summerland. Uh, good morning, uh, Jack. Good morning. And uh, a question that, that has been bothering me ever since Pier BC came up into focus, speaking as a journalist in the interior here, uh, I, I, I am somewhat uh, curious as to know if what research has been done to assure solid footings, geologically speaking. Well, I asked the Dr. Shum about that, but he'll give us a study of the pilings right now, the oh, solid right, footings. Because right. uh, yeah. I, I am quite concerned on this, because uh, I, I, I personally feel that uh, this type of, uh, of a development will be extremely uh, uh, beneficial. For Let's get the answer on the footings. Uh, the footings are very much the same as for the Granville Square building, that tremendous big office building, which is much higher than anything we're putting on the pier. The only difference, the uh, problem with the footings is the cost is higher than we originally expected it to be. A and we'll know by Tuesday exactly what the cost will be. But the present indications are the cost will be exactly as estimated in the $85 million. That's the extra for the piling. Extra for the piling. It's all included in the $85 million and in the a shortfall of 20 million, which Mrs. McCarthy mentioned earlier. That's all included. And okay. all the indications are there are no more problems in regard to the footings. Their casings will go down, but they use casings for the Granville Square building, and it's a much larger building. Well, my thanks to you, Dr. Gordon Shrum, and to you, Grace McCarthy. The next step, therefore, is up to the City Council of Vancouver and to some extent the federal government. That's correct. Well, Ray mm -hmm. Perot promises money every time he opens his mouth. Well, uh, we'd like to get some of the money back uh, that British Columbia sends to Ottawa, and I think this is so a very good way to do it. If you didn't object to the $4 billion Western Development Fund based on their energy policy, you'd get all the money you wanted. Uh, reduced by the, what they would take off the top, and that was our, that's our dispute with the federal government. But Again, I say that's another dispute, and, uh, and uh, I'd like to just uh, suggest that the thousands upon thousands of jobs that this will create, just in, in construction alone, and the ongoing jobs, both part-time for university students, high school students, for full-time jobs, will we'll just bring millions of dollars of jobs to the city of Vancouver. But seriously speaking, on a news point, you say, Grace McCarthy, by the end of January, we must have a cooperative agreement with the other government bodies or it's down the tube. That's correct. Mm -hmm. My thanks to Grace Thank McCarthy. Thank you so Robinson. much, Jack. Next, uh, Stephen Rogers and After the Deluge. I asked Stephen Rogers, the Minister of Environment in Victoria, and also the minister in charge of the provincial energy program to come in this morning so we could kind of go on the record about the flood damage. I wasn't here at the time, but I saw reports about the flood damage since I've come back uh, in that dreadful Christmas raining. How, where and how bad was the damage? 
all over southwestern British Columbia and, and moderate to severe, depending on where you were. It started raining just later Christmas Day and it rained, uh, rained and the temperature went up very substantially, so we had a very substantial runoff and um, we had flooding in Hope and Hatsik, uh, in Pemberton, on Vancouver Island, at the Cowichan, and of course the worst flooding of all was in Squamish. Now it says $13 million damage. How much of that would be damaged to the homes and property of individual citizens? We're estimating about uh, two and a half million dollars of that. Well, so therefore most of the damage would be to what then? Highways? Well, yeah, there were about 30 bridges washed out that I saw. Uh, quite a lot of highways taken away. Uh, a lot of dike work needs to be uh, done, riverbank improvements. We've got to get into some stream clearing because when you get this type of flooding, Trees come down, plug up small creeks. We have to send in a crew to, to uh, remove that. Uh, otherwise, it, you run the possibility of building up a small lake, which eventually breaks. Then you have really severe flooding. Uh, will the federal government help to repair the damage done to provincial bridges and roads? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a formula with, uh, with Ottawa. It's, it's under their, uh, forgotten the name of the act, but when the damage exceeds $1 per capita of population on any particular disaster, then... Uh, then the federal government starts to contribute and it goes on a sliding scale from there on up. So they'll contribute about 50% of the cost. Will there be people, now when the people come for compensation, what will they get? I'm talking about the individuals whose muddy houses we've seen on television, whose ruined furniture and fridges and plaster walls. What will they get? It's got to be their, their personal home. It can't be a summer cottage or um, a second home. It's their primary residence and they'll be reimbursed for the costs of the repairs to that home. Uh, there are a few things we don't cover. We don't cover rare works of art, uh, special antiques, uh, um, rare collections that are left in the basement, uh, just because those things are difficult to evaluate. But normal household effects, furniture, carpeting, washers, dryers, refrigerators. Uh, we have assessors in the field right now. Uh, hopefully they've already made some settlements so people can have some money to get on with the job of cleaning up. Uh, already you've made oh some yes. settlement. Oh yes. Now what about those people who may be living in a flood plain not officially uh, announced as such? Will they get a second or a third settlement if they've been flooded before? Well there are not too many of them but there are some and uh, we're, we're, we're in one case we're into our fourth claim. Uh, just uh, was talking to the staff this morning on that. I guess government's going to have to look and ask themselves pretty seriously at, at what point does the public treasury pay the cost of uh, keeping someone's, uh, uh, keep rebuilding someone's home that's built located on the floodplain. But an individual can never be to blame. If an individual builds a home somewhere, he must have approval from the local authority before he can get a permit to build that home. Well, only, only about 60% of the municipalities in the province uh, now incorporate uh, uh, floodplain bylaws in their zoning so that uh, any new zoning that come, uh, comes on stream in the province has to uh, fall within our, our floodplain guidelines, but uh, existing zoning doesn't have to, and some municipalities uh, uh, don't, don't incorporate it. And I'm constantly badgered by mayors and municipal councillors saying, uh, look, we've been here 80 years, it's never flooded here, uh, you know, we know in this area the old timers don't remember <coughs> a flood, now please let us build on this land that's easy to build on, very accessible, um, we'll sign a hold harmless clause for the provincial government. And I've even had people come to me with their whole harmless clause saying, what does this mean? I've been flooded out. Now I need some money to uh, rebuild my home. So we, we run the full spectrum of, of the... Hold harmless. In other words, they'll indemnify you against any floods. But when the floods happen, up they come to you for money. Well... Can't you arbitrarily... I mean, surely it's your duty. There's a mountain somewhere up there, too, which is going to... Yeah, the barrier at Garibaldi. The That's barrier right. at Garibaldi. Have you got the people out of the path of that mountain uh, yet? Some of them, yes. And one of the things that happened as a result of this was that uh, we have a report indicating that the barrier may come down. And if it does come down, it would go into Daisy Lake. As a result of that, uh, we asked Hydro to lower Daisy Lake, uh, I think about six meters. And uh, when this great flood started, uh, great rain started, the, the uh, operator of the, of the hydro dam at uh, Daisy Lake used good common sense and started to fill the lake up a little bit. So, in fact, uh, that actually was of assistance because we had a little area to, for a shock absorber there for the water. Yeah, I can understand the Daisy Lake business, yeah. but now you are now faced with people still living in flood plains. Oh, sure. Do you have to sit kind of helpless and wait for local councils to, to pass bylaws saying no building will take place in this flood plain? 
Um, not, on, not on any new ones, but on, on existing ones. They allow construction on the floodplain. It's quite easy to build on the floodplain and build a floodproof house. That, that's uh, architecture school at UBC has a whole host of suggestions for building on the floodplain. The question is, you don't just pour a slab and build your standard uh, bungalow house on it because uh, that's going to be the problem. Richmond is a classic example of a, uh, of a municipality where they've said the bedrooms are on the second floor for a good reason. There are very few bungalows in Richmond. There's certainly new, no new ones being built because they recognize the fact that they're on the floodplain. Because the floodplain is a once in 50 and a once in 100 year problem, isn't it? Yeah, we use that statistic, but it's really it's somewhat meaningless. You know. But that's right, it, it's not that frequent. No, but you've got to be prepared for the once in 50 or the once in 100 years. That's right. So from now on, you people will control building on floodplains and will not allow it. That's right. Well, within certain restrictions, obviously a farm, we allow farm buildings to be built, uh, but we want the, the farm buildings in a, in a small way floodproof. In uh, no, with 20 feet up off the ground oh no, or whatever. Oh, oh no, for farms we're really, really very reasonable because they have to be there. But for subdivision on the, on, on the floodplain, we can say if it's behind a dike and uh, if it meets other criteria, fine, you can go up a little higher. So anyway, now uh, there's no problem about the money for the compensation for the people and you're not making any public appeals because it will all be covered by tax monies one way or another. Is well, that correct? Yeah, that, that's the compensation. The, the public appeal process, uh, I'd just like to say that you know the, the, the public, especially in Squamish, really pitched in already. When the, when the need was there, they were already there in a very, uh, in very sizable amounts. I mean, I was there the, the day after the water went down and uh, the whole community just pitched in. Well, that's the kind of public appeal that we wanted and they don't seem to have any trouble getting that kind of support in Squamish. If you have any questions about your floodplain problems, phone now to Stephen Rogers, the minister in charge of the emergency programs in British Columbia, after the break. <laughs> she talked to you about the super tanker. Oh. Squamish, go ahead to Stephen Rogers. Yes, I'm calling from Tantalus Acres, which is on mile 10. Hello? Yes, yep. yes, speak up, ma'am. Ye yes, I'm... Go on, we can hear you. Yes, I'm phoning from... Ta huh. Your TV is up, my little precious gem. Oh, I'm phoning from Tantalus Acres, which mm -hmm. is in mile 10, the upper Squamish. Right. And... Um, we were totally flooded out. Now, I bought the home just a year ago, and there was a prospectus that we were given at the time when we bought the home, which says that there is no known floodplains in this area. Now, when we bought the home, as I say, we had no idea that there was any flooding that had occurred before. But one of my neighbors came over one day and says to me, oh, yes, you had four feet of water in your home. I went, oh, you're kidding. What do I do, sort of a thing. So anyway, there was a flood there in 1975, I understand, and now again we have another flood in 1980. Now, we have children, I have a daughter who's five years old, and my neighbors have two children and babies and all that. We were evacuated from the area at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Boxing Day by uh, Al Bird, who is from the Search and Rescue. Yep. Right. And he asked us to you know, if we could make our way out, as he had a girl who had hypothermia in his truck. She had been found swimming at 17 Mile, <coughs> her truck being totally submerged. Jeez, oh. Now, the problem is that these are our only homes. These are our permanent residents. Now, do you want to stay there? I presume you're happy you're going to stay there? Well, the thing is that... Will you buy her house if she wants out? No. No, we'll pay for the cost of the repairs. We You'll pay for the house. cost of the repair, but you won't buy it out? No. The thing that, that's wrong with the whole thing, can't, if I may... Yes, please. If I can interject, is that, that the whole the whole problem is that um, we need some kind of commitment from the government into us to whether or not they'll give us a commitment as to diking or if there is another flood and say next year it could happen. Like we've got all our worldly possessions in that home, all of our appliances, you know, things that, that okay, are unrepairable. Okay, so you're asking for a commitment as to the future. That's right, because how okay. can I put my life and everything that I own into that home and have it go down the drain. How much did you pay for the house? Pardon me? How much did you pay for the house? What did I pay for it? Yeah. I paid twenty nine five. It's a trailer and we've added on to it. 
Now, what commitment can you give Harris to future protection, or is that entirely in the hands of the municipality? No, it's not entirely in the hands of the municipality, but we have a joint uh, provincial municipal cost sharing program. We've spent about eight and a half million dollars this year on dikes. Uh, that is 19 in the, in the last right. year since we're just into the new year. I expect that uh, we'll be doing a little more than that in, in the coming year, but there are a number of areas in the province we could use at least uh, twice, probably three times that amount of money on, on dikes and riverbank improvements. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm not familiar with all the properties. I am familiar with Mr. Bird and, and what he was able to do in saving that woman's life, actually, which he did. That was very good. Well, that's all we can tell you, that they will pay. Well, when I phoned, the assessors came up to our place on Saturday, uh -huh. and they told, I have like all the appliances, I got a brand new microwave in August, and when they came up, they told me to take my stuff down and have it repaired. Now, how do they, how do they expect me to take it down to have it repaired when they're not giving me any type of commitment as to whether or not, you know, are they going to pay the full cost of it? And even then, when I did phone down to the repair place, they said in six, six months, that, that things are going to get rusted, and I'm going to have problems with these appliances, and they're brand new. Now, there's a problem, but that's the individual's problem. Well, that's right. Um, you know, I, I've said to people if they have difficulty with the adjusters, they're free to contact me or in my office, and uh, we'll certainly do what we can. Uh, I think it should point out, you know, we're probably the most generous area, uh, certainly in North America, uh, that is British Columbia, in terms of helping people in the floodplain. What she's if this is happens, and if this happens anywhere else, <coughs> if it happens in the United States or in many places in Eastern Canada, nothing. forget it. You get nothing. So this is really a uh, grant from the provincial yeah, treasury. Yeah, but once you start to be generous, for instance, if the whole thing is totally destroyed, you'll get a new one. If it's just rusty and wet, they'll do a temporary repair, and six months from now, she'll be saying, hey, they, they didn't fix it right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've been the minister That's for the just over problem. a year. Like we, the, as you pointed out, the main problem is, like, if we go in and we repair and we put every, all of our money into our homes, yeah, it no, happens yeah, in another year. You were, you were apparently misadvised when you bought the house. You weren't told about the 1975 flood. No, I wasn't. I a was good thing if you're buying a house anywhere nowadays to say to the real estate man, What's the floodplain here? What's the history of flooding in this part of BC, isn't it? Well, you, you're still going to run into the possibility of, of people um, getting flooded out that aren't on the floodplain. Not everyone uh, gets uh, caught in a flood is on the floodplain. However, it, it you know it's it's wise to check. And, well, if uh, you're on the side of a hill, Stephen, you're all right. Uh, eh? <laughs> not in Bella Coola, you weren't. <laughs> oh, bad trouble in Bella Coola. Thanks, yeah. ma'am, and the very best of luck. Um, do another segment with uh, no. Here's one from Vernon. Did they have flooding in Vernon? in Vernon, but I have a question for Mr. Rogers. Uh, Mr. Rogers, um, if you're willing to pay flood damage insurance, why will you not pay for wind damage insurance? Oh, because you can buy insurance for wind damage and you cannot buy insurance for flood damage. And uh, on that basis, we only pay for the ones that, uh, for which there is uh, no insurance available. Okay, the last time I talked to Capri Insurance in Vernon, they said you can get flood damage insurance. Uh, no, no one that I know sells flood insurance uh, to people that could use flood insurance. I'm, I'm sure I can get flood insurance for my home, but then my home's not in the floodplain. I, I lived in the floodplain once and I've suffered through a flood, so when I moved I made sure that I was not in the floodplain. But uh, I'm, it's not, to the best of my knowledge, no one sells flood insurance. You might get bus pipe insurance, but not oh, flood yeah, insurance. Oh yeah, that's correct. Okay, ma'am, thanks for your call. Go ahead, please. Uh, Jack, those uh, houses down there on the Richmond Plain, they double, uh, they, what, you, they're going to go to bed at night and they're going to end up down in the Wangafuka Strait that only tied down by one inch uh, wide uh, strips of galvanized metal. What houses are you talking about? New houses in Richmond. <laughs> well, uh, uh, all, you know, in, in Richmond, all the bedrooms are on the second floor uh, uh, for, <laughs> for a very good reason. And, and Richmond doesn't anyway. suffer the same problem because uh, Richmond's uh, uh, flooding potential is much more from tidal than it is from uh, river pressure. Well, one day we'll have a big flood in the Fraser Valley. It's bound to come, they tell it's, us. It's uh, bound to come, and the place that we're most vulnerable is uh, Nickelman Island. Nickelman Island. Yep. But the dikes are in reasonable good shape, I hope. They are, but uh, we could always use more money for improving dikes. But it's from it's the federal government. Oh no, no, no! It's it's a federal provincial. Federal business, provincial. But, uh, anybody who's dissatisfied with the assessor's um, valuation of the flood damage can come direct to your office in Victoria. Sure, but Jack, let let's go through a few things. Uh, we've gone through three or four uh, uses of, of uh, assessors from floods, and I don't think I've had more than a couple dozen complaints from virtually hundreds of people that have been involved. So. Uh, the uh, the assessors that we've used in the past have been most satisfactory, and, and uh, 
uh, in fact, been highly complimentary to some people. Obviously, not everyone's happy, but uh, I think it's a pretty good system. These are your assessors or private oh, no, assessors? No, 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 private assessors. Private insurance yes. company assessors. Yes. Fair enough. Just before you go, what about this super tanker that's going to go down the straits? Atlantic Richfield are talking about sending a super tanker down January the 20th, I think. Well, uh, we've taken so the position as a government that uh, we think they should go with the overland route from, uh, from Alaska, but uh, the Americans want to try out bringing in a, a tanker that's well in excess of the amount that uh, the Magnuson uh, bill allowed. So uh, it's being brought in in ballast and uh, through, uh, through entirely through American waters. I've sent a letter, a telegram actually, to the federal government. Uh, asking them. Asking them, uh, you know, why a why we weren't informed, and b uh, what their position is on it. Here's a call from Sardis, maybe a flood victim. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Rogers. I'm calling from Sardis. Now, um, we had a flood, and uh, you built the dike up. And at the particular time that that was being done, my husband told you that it wouldn't be sufficient, and that the exact same thing would break through. Now he came over to Victoria to see you. And he begged, pleaded, and wanted to borrow some money to do it himself. But you refused his loan and said, no, that's as far as it would go. He had to build his own dike. Ye yes. And what happened? Well, it, it's come through again this year in a worse state than the time before when w my husband explained it to Mr. Rogers. House damaged? Yes, it is. Extremely. Well, you can't give individuals money to build their own dikes. No, I know that, but at the time it was being done, my husband explained if they went along uh, roughly another 20, 25 feet, uh, whatever he's done there, it would come through behind on that twi that breach. You and plead guilty or not guilty? Well, the guilty. case is before the ombudsman. It's uh, I know th I know the man involved. I guess he's uh, written to the prime minister, to the premier. He's right. gone to the ombudsman. He's gone to court on it. I guess we'll have to decide this thing in another forum. Thank you, ma'am. And my thanks to Stephen Rogers, Minister in Charge of Emergency Programs. Don't complain to me, complain to him. After the break, a free for all. Well, a free for all is a good way to start the year. Nothing very exciting to report to you on my particular Christmas break. We went to Hawaii, played golf at Kapalua. It uh, rained quite a bit, but not enough to spoil the golf. Uh, Christmas Day, it was like Squamish in the floods. Just came straight down, hammering down. But wasn't mugged, wasn't robbed. Everybody was very nice. Prices are up a bit. It was uh, $3 American for butter at the corner store at Napili in Maui. That's uh, three dollars plus twenty percent. Twenty percent is. I'll work it out myself. This is the start of a new year. I don't need any help from the crew to tell you it's three dollars and sixty cents Canadian. For <laughs> and we we had great flights both ways. Went western both ways. But at Maui Airport, somebody is going to have to do something about Maui Airport for you people that have been to Hawaii. It's like Toronto, 1960. You know, 400 of you in a holding room, PA system that doesn't work. You don't know what flight's going where or to which. Calculated to increase one's blood pressure just a little, but I got good marks from the family because I didn't say a word to anybody. As far as name dropping is concerned, I watched this old guy dotting through, dotting through uh, Maui Airport and I thought, He's a famous TV star. No, it can't be. Couldn't he be that shabbily dressed, says I to me. So I followed him, because I'm a celebrity hound, you know. Guess who it was? Harvey Corman. Looks much older in real life than he does on the Carol Burnett show. But I tell you, the same applies to me. I ain't no celebrity, but I look much older in real life too. As a matter of fact, I was visiting some people yesterday, and it could have hit the woman. She said, it's amazing how slim the television makes you look when you really are so fat. That's the kind of remark that's, you know, inclined to endear one. Back to business, though. I have an early copy of what you've been waiting for, distributed at public expense by the Social Credit Government in Victoria. 
from the office of the Premier, W.R. Bennett, Premier. Oh, debates of the Legislative Assembly, Hansard, on the Constitution, the official report on the debates of the Legislative Assembly, which are being sent round at a cost, I am told, of $100,000 to every home in British Columbia. I must admit it's printed in very cheap paper and very small type. And I venture to suggest, fascinated though most of us are with the constitutional problems of this nation, that not one in a thousand will read it. But it looks nice, and I've got to tell you, in, I wish I'd given you this to show up, but I can't. Too late now. There are two flags in Bennett's letters. One is the maple leaf, and the other is the rising sun of BC, and the maple leaf has got pride of place. So that proves that Premier Bennett is so too a federalist and a believer in unity and constitution and decency and whatnot. You know, I was only half joking when I was talking about Trudeau coming back for a state visit. It's really quite incredible the way since uh, he made Lalonde the ministry, Minister of Energy and uh, Chrétien in charge of the Constitution, how he has been traveling around the world. I forget who it was I asked at the end of the year if he was going for a UN job and they said no. Somebody from Ottawa. One of the many peripatetic cabinet ministers who were prancing about the country at the time. And they denied it. But I'm beginning to wonder if this north-south uh, travel of Mr. Trudeau really is a build-up for a job with the United Nations once he gets the Constitution back and uh, picks a successor, a successor for himself in the Liberal Party. If you were to ask me, or offer me a $100 bill right now to name a possible successor within the Liberal Party, I couldn't name you one. As far as the Tories are concerned, of course, I'm inclined to think that the man they probably should pick from a merchandising point of view is this attractive Irishman out of Montreal, Irish-Canadian, Brian Mulroney. I don't think Flora will go for it again. They're going to have a leadership uh, convention of the Tories in Ottawa at the end of February. And they have a few candidates. They've got Big Bluff John Crosby. They've got Brian Mulroney. They've got, must be others. Can't think of them offhand. Free for all with Webster. Back from refreshed and full of vim and vigor and vitality. Slim as a sylph. And if you'll believe that, you'll believe anything after the break.
Not that it's not all this year unless I have to. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Happy New Year to you. You too. There's one question I'd like to ask as a taxpayer in BC, and that is how often and how many times are some of these people going to collect on this floodplain? Well, uh, Stephen Rogers was telling us about one case he learned about this morning where it's the fourth claim. Yes, but this could go on for many more times for another hundred years. And I don't think that the Fraser River uh, since 1948 has had the dikes fixed up. I'm a hunter and a fisherman and I've been up and down those dikes and there's a lot of other farmers that are complaining about them. The only thing that has been done to them is is that the muskrats have made better homes. <laughs> well, uh, Roger says that they need more work on the dikes in the Fraser Valley. I remember well the 48 flood. But is what's going to happen to all those homes in that floodplain in Richmond, as that other gentleman said, if they all go down the Fraser, are we going to pay everybody in Richmond? Well, let's hope it doesn't happen. That's about all you can hope at the moment. But quite obviously, governments have to move in when ordinary people, I mean, ordinary people in, who've been allowed to build by permit in places in which they should not have been allowed to build. Our kind of government, whether it's social credit or NDP, is going to come up with compensation. But if this person uh, that lived at 10 Mile there was to be bought out and then given the choice of either buying the home back for the same price and living in it or moving and not nothing ever being paid on that place, place again, then it would protect some of us taxes. Roger says no, they won't buy out the houses, but I appreciate your concern. Go ahead, please. Hello. Morning. Hello, good morning. Mr. Webster, uh, why is not the media a little more positive thinking? On what? On many things. We have unemployment here. Well, this center could put a lot of people to work. And, and as to the floods, look at Dollarton and Maple Ridge. The people got out and built sandbags. They didn't have a flood this year. It's true what that previous uh, man just said. You can be paying and paying for years. Well, I agree with you that the press, is, the media, is not always as positive as it might be. In my own particular attitude, you know, you're better lately. I'll give you credit. I am not better lately. I'm just to say. You are. You used to be very, very, uh, very radical in many things. And I give you credit for changing. I haven't changed a bit. Yes, you've changed a great Just because you can see me smile, you know I'm really quite a nice guy. Yes, you are. Smile more often. It improves you. Thanks very much, my dear. Go ahead, please. Hello? Can't hear you. Hello? Hello, Jack? Yes. Hello, I agree with you about Maui Airport. And they should cover that landing strip in at Maui. It's so windy, eh? Really awful. Yeah. I just wanted to say also a great big yes for the Pier BC. The concept is fantastic, and we need the, the jobs. and. The well, the important thing that we got from Grace McCarthy this morning is that by the end of January, she's got to have a yes or a no from the feds and the city council audits down the tube, and then we can stop messing around with these models. Well, I hope Mike Harcourt says yes. Much obliged, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. I, I can't help but laugh when I heard that to the lady saying that you were so much better when you smiled. <laughs> Why laugh? <laughs> it's just kind of so funny. You were rather radical at one stage. I think you're probably mellowing like the rest of us with age. However, uh, you did mention a few moments ago about Prime Minister Trudeau as successor, and you mentioned Brian Mulroney. Well, frankly, having lived in Satyon, where he is now the head, as you know, of Iron Ore. Iron Ore of Canada, yeah. And having lived there, and my husband and my late husband worked there, and there was a QNS and L, which is Quebec, North Shore, and Labrador Railway. Uh huh. Uh, He's not the man. He's immature at this stage. Well, the point I make, though, is a very practical point, isn't that Mulroney is bilingual, attractive, charming, and capable of, capable of being merchandised. And in this country, he, uh, you, must have a, you must have a political product, like it or lump it, which can be merchandised. I it's, don't it's, think a person's appearance takes, uh, should be taken into consideration. It's what he has up on top. Of course you're right, but you're wrong. It's the Regan syndrome. Uh, I, no, I, I don't think so. Do you I know that Regan says he doesn't dye his hair? I know. <laughs> Isn't that hard to believe? Uh, it is, but actually, um, Mulroney, uh, Brian Mulroney, is 
so full of his own importance and combing his hair, he's uh, sort of a very... Okay, ma'am, but I'll bet you he's one of the prime contenders, although Crosby will probably take it. If there is a fight this year, now there may not be a fight, uh, Fotheringham, who is quite good in these things, he's got to be good in something. Margaret Mead. Fotheringham says that in all probability there will be a lackluster endorsation of Joseph Clark. And uh, if that's going to happen, there won't be any fight and nobody will declare themselves as candidates. Otherwise, you're going to have Flora, I suppose, and Crosby and Mulroney. There must be many others, but my mind is a blank this morning. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Jack? Yeah. Yeah, have you heard anything recently from Mr. Murchie on the Murchmobile and whether or not he's getting provincial support? Must follow that up, the Murchmobile. Much one. Must follow it up. I will do. I don't think so. It was a very brave effort for those of you who didn't see the car which he produced in six days with the help of some cooperative industrialists and uh, body shops around here in which we drove into the studio and which I piled into the post on the door in the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, who knows, but I'll check with Murch and see how he, see, seeing how he is getting on. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Go ahead, please. Yes. Hello, Mr. Webster? Yes, ma'am. Here to you. You know, I wanted to mention about BC Pier and the Convention Center. I think this is the proper place because it's downtown core, and the best thing that ever will happen to Vancouver, the approach to the harbor, I think it's just normal, proper place to do. And I think the sooner we start, the better. If we wait, it will cost more, and all this putting down in the false creek. I can take a bus from West End, and I'll be in a few minutes downtown, and down at the BC Pier and Convention Center, the shops, the tourists, and we're going to make millions for Vancouver. And I I think we should smarten up and start it immediately, not argue. BC Pier and Convention Center, the best thing you can find for our Vancouver. Thank, Thank you. you. Love your Scotch accent. Much obliged. Okay. <laughs> That's a Russian accent, of course. <laughs> Russian accent? Of course. How did you guess? Oh, how could you miss? Oh, you couldn't miss. Only perfect Russian accent. Thank you very much. Webster with a free-for-all after the break. First day back after holidays. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. There was a news report that an, a booming ground lease had been given in the Oyster area south of Comox. Yeah, mm-hmm. The Fanny Bay area. Do you, have you heard any more about that? Saw something in the paper about it. Yes, it seems a strange place to do that. I thought maybe you might investigate it. And Oyster River? No, not Oyster River. Where did you say it was? Um, the south of Comos, between Denman and uh, Vancouver Island. Are you an oyster freak? Yeah. Are you an oyster freak? No, I'm not, but uh, they've been there for so long, the oyster... Uh, are the oyster leases federal? I think they are. I have no idea. For sure, oyster yeah. leases. Seem okay, right. ma'am, we'll put it on the list. Good. Much obliged. From Victoria, go ahead, please. Hello, I'd like to raise a question with the Minister of Environment that hasn't been raised yet, very important. Uh, that is the situation in regards to, in every one of these areas that's been devastated by the flood, there's been tremendous, massive, clear-cut logging in the watershed. And it's my position that the, uh, if we don't do something about it and uh, introduce selective logging in our B.C. forest industry, we're going to have a disaster that'll make the uh, one in the Skeena Valley uh, look like uh, chicken feed. Well, are you talking about lack of selective logging up in the Pemberton area? Yes, in, all, in every area, Parksville, uh, Squamish, uh, Bellacoola, there's been massive logging, clear-cut logging, and unless they introduce selective logging in these areas, I mean, we're going to have, uh, uh, well, the Fraser River. I mean, I think that the Fraser River, if they continue the clear-cut log, they're you going to have keep, a, a you major couldn't keep disaster. The B, you couldn't keep the B.C. logging industry going on selective logging, and you know that. They do patch logging, don't they? Clear-cut a square, leave a square, clear-cut a square. Yes, but there's massive cuts. I mean, six mm. to seven hundred acre clear cut. And on top of that, I mean, I'm reading here from the provincial government's forestry talk, the latest issue of their magazine, in regards to clear cut logging. And on page six, they say, we've calculated that just by thinning a forest by selective logging, 
we can increase the annual growth rate of a particular tree up to 44 times. <coughs> Fair enough. I'll accept your point. Don't know enough about it. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Also from Victoria. Yes, yeah, speak up, ma'am. Um, I've been trying to get through to you for quite some time, but uh, you're always uh, so busy. Now, this is a whole change, a uh, new subject. I hope you don't mind. No. Um, I'm a foster parent. Mm -hmm. uh, I am taking care of a grandson who is 16 years old. Uh -huh. Now, they are paying me, the welfare is paying me just a small amount of money, just enough to feed him. That's because you're the grandmother. Yes. If you were not the grandmother, you'd get the full foster care rate. They tell me I'm not entitled to it. That's correct. As a member of the family, uh, human resources are rightly worried about subsidies going to family where the child goes to live with the grandmother by arrangement other than need. You can see their concern. Mm. And unless, the, unless a court uh, gave the child to you in official custody, I doubt if you'll get more than a nominal sum to cover food. And there is some, there is some justification in that, although it's obviously a hardship for you. Well, it is in the fact... I mean, everybody could send their grandchildren to granny and pick up foster care money for their kids. Well, in this case, I have had this boy. <coughs> uh, all I get is uh, he has done very well since I've had him. He wants to keep going to school. He doesn't want to... How old is he? Uh, 16. Where are mommy and daddy? Well, uh, this is something I could... Don't tell me about it. ...gust over the air. No, no, don't tell me about it. But you can see how... Uh, human resources are reasonably enough afraid to open the floodgates of that kind of family arrangement. Mm. That's I a problem. I have asked, you know, if they would, the, the amount they give me just feeds him. He has to take buses to school. He has to have a lunch to go Are you a widow? You know. Are you, are you a widow? I am not. No. 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 And, uh, they look upon it as a family responsibility, but surely they should be available for emergency application from you for... Well, you see, I'm 64 years old. Mm. I cannot go to work. And it makes it a little hard to put, you know, a boy with uh, yeah. that size today, you go down to buy him mm -hmm. clothes. Sure does, ma'am. I'm afraid I can't really help you with that one, although I may do a piece in that story that was in the paper over the weekend about the woman who wants to give her children up to, to human resources. But thanks for your call, ma'am. Where am I going? <coughs> Go ahead, please. Hi, Jack. I just want to ask you a question, then I'll hang up and listen to you. I haven't heard exactly why, but they closed that heroin treatment program, and I was wondering why after all the hoopla about it. Okay, I'll let oh, you go. Okay, hang up and listen, he says. I did a fairly exhaustive program with Rafe Mayer on the failure of the government to plan properly when their compulsory heroin treatment program collapsed in the face of a court decision, which was later reversed by the Court of Appeal. And I see that since uh, Mr. Mayor was on this program that he has given termination notices to a hundred of the more or less unemployed social workers and staff at Brannan Lake. And I see a vague story from Mayor that he's about to look for some kind of treatment center close to a hospital in Vancouver which would come under the Ministry of Health instead of the Alcohol and Drug Commission. Mayor would seem to be going in the right direction, but I don't think he should go into any great grandiose plans to build a hospital for drug addicts. The problem has cooled off a bit for one reason or another. There's no doubt about it. The system has been more or less misused with poly drug treatment. A lot of stuff which should be handled by family doctors and not handled by, by the Alcohol and Drug Commission. So it collapsed as a failure for a variety of reasons, and they're now beginning to trim it down. Although, of course, when they give civil servants notices, that doesn't mean that they're out of work, you know. They get priority for replacement in other government departments unless the whole operation is closed down brutally, right? Right. I needed a nod of the head on that. Where am I going? How much time is that? I forget what the signals mean. Happy New Year. It's good to be back, and I'll be back with Gladys after this commercial break. What is that? A Webster sign. This is my Christmas present, is it? A well. new mug. 
Try and keep it mug. clean. And yeah, uh, kind of drippy. <laughs> Gotta be careful. Is this decaffeinated coffee? No, this is the real thing. We want decaffeinated coffee, Gladys. Well, we're going to go back to it after drinking this morning's batch of coffee. I'm not going to ever be the same. I'm hyper this morning. Tomorrow, quickly. Oh. Nothing. Oh, no, no, no. We have a couple of things up our sleeves, and we've got a lot of good guests for this week, don't we? The Say rest yes. of the week is just fine. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. precisely.